it's better. Okay. Let's, if you don't mind, let's read the 27 again because we haven't been straight before. <coughs> This is one at 27. Hold on one second. Are you streaming now? Mm -hmm. okay. I'm just going to tell them where we are. Okay. Genesis 1 at 27. Okay. So God created man in his own image. Mm -hmm. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So again, he made man in his, in, in his image and in his likeness, male and female. We're not a separate species. As I was saying, biology tells you what you should be doing. If you ever wonder what you should be doing or what your role is, <laughs> Again, look down, biology tells you what you, you're a man or male, you have a specific role. If you're a female, you have a specific role. All that has been clouded today. All, there's a lot of confusion concerning that today. But it's already shown you what you should be doing. Verse 28. And God blessed him and God said unto them, uh -huh. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the power of the air over every living thing that moved upon the earth. So he blessed them. This was the mandate that was given unto this man and woman. And God blessed them and God said unto them, do what? He said, be fruitful. You can only, the man can't be fruitful. A woman and a woman can't be fruitful, but rather you need male and female to have some fruit. And the fruit is the fruit of the womb, which is the child. Again, this is the establishment of the household, the family unit. Now let's go to Genesis, the fifth chapter, because this mandate was carried out. Genesis, the fifth chapter, you want to pick it up at verse one. Genesis five and verse one. When you ready, go ahead. This is the book of the generations of Adam. This is the book of the generations of Adam. You can't have generations of Adam unless you have a man and a woman. Again, it's establishing a family. It said this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God made him. What did he do? Male and female created he them. Male and female created he them. Go ahead. And blessed them. He blessed them. And called their name Adam. And called their name Adam. Even their name, again, the woman was taken out of the man. And called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And what happened? Go ahead. And Adam lived 130 years. Mm -hmm. And he got a son in his own likeness. Go ahead. Left his image and called his name Seth. So he had, he that mandate was carried out. They did that. They had Cain and Abel, we understand, and then Abel was killed by Cain. We understand that that righteous seed, that righteous seed was reestablished through Seth. So it says, and Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Verse 4. In the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years. So after he begotten Seth, were 800 years. Go ahead. And he begot sons and daughters. And he begat sons and daughters. So it wasn't just Seth. He had sons and daughters that are not named. Okay, so that mandate was carried out. And it's been carried out from generation to generation to generation. The problem oftentimes you see is that it's not within the confines of marriage. Understand their role. When you understand what marriage is in the institution of marriage, in principle, the, the fundamental reason for marriage is to have an institution to bring forth children. Let me say that again. The institution of marriage primarily is to have, this institution functions and serves as an institution in which you are to bring forth children. A covenanted man and woman. That's what it's for. That's what he established in the beginning. Again, we're just talking about the foundation of the family unit. Let's go to Malachi, the second chapter, because it wasn't just any child. See, when you really look at what he set, how what he set up, man and woman, the covenant that he put forth, the man that he gave, and why he gave it, you wouldn't go into such an institution. You will go into such an agreement without understanding. Malachi, the second chapter. And here in Malachi, we find out what that was all about. Malachi, the second chapter, because he's rebuking the mistreatment 
of the wife of the youth, but he says why he brought you together in the first place. Mal man and woman. Malachi, the second chapter, verse 15. When you ready, go ahead. And did not he make one? He said, and did not he make one? Go ahead. Yet had he the residue of the spirit. Uh-huh. And wherefore one. He said, hey, hey, he said, and did he not make one? Yeah, he had the residue of the spirit. And why? One. Why did he make one? Go ahead. That he might seek a godly seed. That he might seek a godly seed. That's what he's doing. See, when you and then when you understand, understand this. When he made man in his God. You understand? So the fruit that you're supposed to be bringing forth, he said to bring not just any seed, but a godly seed. Ultimately, another one that would be God at when it's all said and done. So he had this, this institution of marriage and brought the man and the woman together in order to bring that about. We made marriage into so many other things that it's not about. And, and we don't understand our particular function and role as husband and wife and father and mother within this unit. And therefore, we have all this dysfunction. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal, deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Like I said, he was he was rebuking mistreatment of the wife. But in, in finding out that you find out why he brought you together in the first place. So now let's look at ultimately this order. This is uh, 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. We want to pick it up at verse 3. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter and verse 3. When you ready, go ahead. But I would have you know uh -huh. that the head of every man is Christ. So he said, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. See, Christ is your head as the man. So it even goes beyond just man, woman, and child. Now, spiritually, who's head and who? The head of the man is Christ. Go ahead. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of the woman is the man. The head is not the woman. Right? He says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and what? And the head of Christ is God. And the head of Christ is God. So here you see, even the order spiritual, you see the father, you see the son, and none of that, you got man and you got woman. That is the order. That is the order of this thing. We have flipped the order all around. First of all, God is anywhere in it. Christ is really not in it. Then if you have a mother and a father, or a man and a woman, there oftentimes you have a woman who is the head. Or if you, you got to just join a family where the woman is trying to be the head, but the order is father, the son, man, and woman. And ultimately, you will bring forth children. And if you were doing this thing properly, you would have God at the end of that. That's some true procreation. But, then, but now let's go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Because we want to start off and I, and I emphasize the husband's role because you see such a dearth of manhood. You see such a, a failure to lead as men and therefore we have what we have today, which is again a bunch of confusion. This, this, so we're going to deal with what the man should be doing and as the, it's like anything else, as the head. This thing from the head down. As the head, you you are the one that has to hold this thing together. You are the strength of the household. Ephesians the fifth chapter. We're going to pick it up at verse twenty three. What is the husband? When you ready, go ahead. For the husband is the head of the wife. But again, for the husband is the head of the wife. No, <laughs> men shouldn't venture away from that. Or uh, flee from that and say, well, we kind of we kind of do this 50-50 thing. I'm going to tell you something. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. It said, for the husband is the head of the wife. Why is that? Why I say there's no such thing? Even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the body. He says, well, I say there's no such thing because when you look at it, let's say you don't agree on something. You talk about, well, we 50-50 until it comes to a point where it's there's no compromise. And then what? Who are you supposed to? Who are you supposed to? Uh, who's supposed to listen to who? 
It said, for the husband is the head of the wife, and then he likens the headship of a man over his wife as Christ, who was the head of the church. So Christ, we understand, is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. He tell you another place, I am married unto you. He said, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So as men, when you're looking around to find out what you're supposed to do, understand you're supposed to look at God and look within yourself because you are the one that is the head. The buck stops with you, as they say. Verse 24 or verse 25. Go ahead. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. So if Christ is our example of what a husband should be, See, again, if we go into this thing understanding what we should be doing, we'll look at it a lot differently. It said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ did what? Also love the church and gave himself for it. When you're talking about a man's love, you're talking about sacrifice. That's what you're talking about. To provide. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And he did so. It said, and he gave himself for it. He sacrificed. He laid it all on the line. Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Uh huh. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Go ahead. Not having a spot or rape or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. So again, when you're looking at this relationship between a man and a woman and you want insight look at the relationship between Christ and his church and what he did for his church sacrifice and save as a savior of the body that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having pure not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish let's get down to verse 31 when you ready go ahead for this cause shall the man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Again, Paul, take the apostle Paul takes you right back to the beginning. Right back to the beginning of this thing. Again, if you want some insight on how to be a man, how to be a woman, look at what thus saith the Lord. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. And another thing, you leave a father and mother behind, you should understand they shouldn't be in your relationship. That relationship is between you and your wife. So now it says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and she be joined unto his wife. You start in your own household and they two shall be one flesh. Verse 32. This is the great mystery. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning what? But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Look at Christ and the church if you want to know what you should be doing. The man was supposed to love. He sacrificed. And you see, if you understand what the church should be doing, you should understand what a woman's supposed to be doing. We're going to get there. Verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And so you love your wife even as yourself. So if you love, you are what, so you're not going to abuse your wife. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And what we think love is today, and talk, people talking about romance from Rome, Roman love. Roman love is not true love. That's not true love. Look at what a man is doing. Is he providing? Is he doing the things necessary for you? Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Go ahead. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. And the wife should reverence her husband. But now let's go to uh, Ezekiel. Because again, the Bible gives us insight. And here we see the relationship between the Lord and his woman or his, his wife. And we want to pick it up, Ezekiel, the, first, the 16th chapter. We want to pick it up at verse 1. Because we want to find out what the Lord did for his wife. And we'll find that he provided. Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. We ready? Go ahead. Again, the word of the Lord gave unto me, saying, uh -huh. 
son of man calls Jerusalem to know her abomination. Now he said his prophet unto his wife because one thing the Lord is not negligent. He has neglected the wife, but rather the woman has not fulfilled her role, which is ultimately submission. Again, when you look at the, if the church is the bride, the church is supposed to adhere to what the Lord said to do. You see that even in Exodus, the 24th chapter, when they went into a covenant, they kept saying, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and do what? Obey. Obey. Be obedient. But the woman had not done that, even though the Lord had fulfilled his duty and he's showing what he's done here. So he says this message unto his woman, unto his to the church, the congregation to show them the error of their ways. Verse three. And say, thus said the Lord God unto Jerusalem, uh -huh. thy birth and thy nativity is the land of Canaan. Oh, yeah. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother a Hittite. That's just talking about the genesis of the nation because they went into the land of Canaan. And that's the people that dwelt there. But verse 4. And it's for thy nativity. Mm -hmm. And the day that thou was born, thy navel was not cut. Neither was thou washed in the waters to suckle thee. Uh -huh. Thou was not salted at all, nor swallowed at all. None I pity thee. Do any of these things unto thee to have compassion upon thee? Go ahead. But thou was cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou was born. So when he found this woman, or this, this is talking about the genesis of the nation in a terrible situation. Again, you talking about some people who were some shepherds, some slaves. But ultimately, he did what? Verse six. And when I passed by thee. And I saw thee polluted in thine own blood, mm -hmm. I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. So he brought this woman or this nation out of a particular situation. What did he do? Verse 7. I caused thee to multiply as the blood of the field. Uh -huh. and thou hast increased and waxing great. And thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned and thine hair is grown, whereas thou was naked and bare. You were once naked and bare, but he says, now you come into excellent ornaments, your breasts are fashioned, thine hair is grown, whereas thou was naked and bare. You are starting to have, to be attractive and to look good. And what was this time? Verse 8. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, uh -huh. behold, thy time was a time of love. He said, when I passed by you and looked upon me, behold, it was a time of love. Again, this is likened to the relationship between a man and a woman. So in this case, you see the Lord providing, doing everything for this woman. But the woman had, in this case, had done what she was supposed to do. Now, when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, that time was a time of love. And I did what? And I spread my skirt over thee. I spread my skirt over thee. In other words, I covered you. And that's ultimately what a man should do for his woman. A man is the covering of the woman. The protection for the woman. The provision or provider for the woman. He said, and I spread my skirt over thee and did what? And covered thy nakedness. And covered thy nakedness. You was in a position of no protection. You was in a position of no provision. And I, he said, I covered that. Go ahead. Yeah, I swear unto thee. Uh -huh. Entered into a covenant with thee. And entered a covenant of marriage. Go ahead. Said the Lord God, and thou became his mind. And you became mine. You became mine. Go ahead. Then wash thy thee with water. Mm -hmm. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee. Go ahead. And I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skin. And I girded thee about with fine linen uh -huh. and I covered thee with silk. So, go ahead. I decked thee also with ornaments and I put bracelets upon thine hands and a chain on thy neck. And I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thy ears and a beautiful crown so he brought her to a specific position. That's what he did. He said, I, I decked you with ornaments and put braces upon thy hands and, ch and a chain on thy neck and I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thine ears and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Verse 13. Thou was, thou was decked with gold and silver and thy raiment was a fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil. And thou was exceedingly beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. You prospered into a kingdom. You wouldn't need anything because he provided. He provided it. And he, he gave you, you really had the best. Verse 14. And thou renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty. For it was perfect through my comeliness, 
which I have put upon thee, said the Lord God. So the nation was made beautiful through him. But now let's go to, uh, because again, that get, we gain insight into what a man should do. A man should provide. Let's go to First Timothy. Oftentimes you will see not even the basics being done. So oftentimes you will see some, you will see in today's time, modern time, you will see a woman choose a man or choose to be with a man and he's not doing the basics. I'm not talking about somebody that's trying and in oh, hard times. I'm talking about somebody who never did the basics. And then when you look up, you know, wasted your years, you know, wasted your life, you know, make wasted a few resources that you had a had an opportunity to garner and you want to blame somebody you better look in the mirror because the question is was you dealing with a man in the first place because what would a man do first timothy the fifth chapter and verse eight just like the father just like our, our father or christ he will he will provide first uh timothy the fifth chapter verse eight we ready to go ahead but many provide not for his own uh-huh especially for those of his own house he have denied the faith and his worth in an infant so here at least a righteous man, he said, but if any provide not for his own, it's, and especially for those of his own house, he says he have denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. An infidel is a non-believer. So how are you talking about you, you, you are serving the Lord, you worship him, and you love him, but you're not providing for the household in which you created. I said a story about a young, young lady, a uh, Teenager, she she said to me one day, you know, my father always talking about God, but he ain't never done nothing for me. And I immediately thought about this. You need to stop talking. You need to stop talking. Well, I, I knew, a, knew a man, he was in the word years ago. He started talking about his kid that he had, but he don't talk to, never did anything for. I said, you can't keep doing that. You need to go find your son. You need to go. You need to go reestablish a relationship. You need to provide. Well, I ain't gonna do that. Well, what you? Why are you here? He says again. He says that uh, you should provide for your household. That's what you should do. You should provide. You, he said, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he have denied the faith. And it's worse than an infidel or a non-believer. Let's go to uh, Genesis, the 18th chapter. Because sometimes people or men, let's say what you could say, but they say within themselves, well, I, I provide for my house. I take care of my, you might have a wife and children. Okay. You know, I buy them with George when they come out, whatever you do. Okay. But that's not, <laughs> that's not all of what you, that's what you should do. Your headship doesn't stop there. Genesis, the 18th chapter and the verse, we're going to pick it up at verse 17. Genesis, the 18th chapter and verse 17. When you're ready, go ahead. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? So now Abraham is the one, the father of faith, as he's called, that patriarch. He's the one where he's called, he called him. He said, come out, walk before me and be thou perfect. I, and he said that he would have a seed. And that seed would be like the stars of heaven. In multitude. But here he says, the Lord says, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Because Abraham was old and he was promised, it was promised him that he would have a seat. But he knew something about Abraham. Let's pick it up in verse 18. Saying that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. Uh -huh. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. He said, I he says, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. Verse 19. For I know him. I know him. And what is he going to do? That he will command his children and his household after him. Uh -huh. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So he said, I know him. I know this thing about Abraham. That he will command his children and his household after him. See, as a man, you are the spiritual head of your household. I'm going to say that again. As a man, you are the spiritual head of your household. Christ, the head of man, man is the head of the woman. You are the head. You are the one that is supposed to direct the household in which way it's supposed to go spiritually. 
Again, the buck stops with two. He said, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. That's your responsibility. He will see the example of Abraham. When you look at generations after, even after, they were saved in the family because of what Abraham did. See, what you do in a generation has, and what today has ripples for generations. You can set your family and families after you on the right course, on a proper course of righteousness. You can also take them off the course. But now let's go to Joshua, the 24th chapter. Because as a man, you have to have the fortitude to make sure that you are determining what direction your family goes. And, and you can't be concerned about somebody not liking that. Joshua, the 24th chapter, verse uh, 14. Here we see that captain. And he is charging the nation concerning which way they should go as a nation, how they should worship. Uh, verse 14, when you ready, go ahead. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. He said, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And you want to know what truth is? His word is truth. His commandment is the truth. You have to serve him as it is commanded. And if you're not doing that, you're not serving him, despite what you might believe. So he said, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And what should you do? Go ahead. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. He said, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. The flood here is not talking about Noah. Rather, it's talking about the river. Euphrates. The, and he's talking about what the false worship that the, the fathers were engaged in when they were in southern Babylonia. In the times of Abraham. He called Abraham out of that false worship. Abraham knew the true living God. Here, he said, you need to leave those false gods alone. He says, uh, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. And where else? And in Egypt and serve you the Lord. And serve you the Lord. So he charged the whole nation for that, with that. Go ahead. And if it seem he wanted to you to serve the Lord, uh -huh. choose you this day whom you will serve. Go ahead. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood uh -huh. or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. He said, you better choose the, you better choose you this day. Who are you going to serve? Those gods on the other side of the flood or the gods in the Amorites in whose land in which you dwell? Because he brought them into the land of Canaan. But he made a proclamation about his own household. Go ahead. But it's for me and my house. What are we going to do? We will serve the Lord. He said, but as for me and my house, we will Serve the Lord. See, you are the man in the household. You, if you're, you have, you are responsible spiritually. So, if your wife doesn't want to get with your program, and she want to take the kids in another direction, I'm here to tell you today, you shouldn't allow that. You shouldn't allow that. And say, this is what we gonna do. This is what we gonna. You can't be scared. <laughs> you can't be apprehensive. You, you say, this is what we do. So when she come home and it's Christmas and the, and the Christmas tree, go, what happened to the Christmas tree? I threw it out. What, what a gift? I, I threw it out. What you going to do? I will tear all this stuff down. The problem I often see in just talking with me, I'm talking even in the word, is they don't understand what it is to be a man. You are the head of that household. You direct them in the, in the uh, way in which they would go. And the problem is a lot of men are scared of the confrontation. You can't be scared of the confrontation. You can't be scared of the confrontation. You have to stand firm in your place, unmovable when it comes to work with thus saith the Lord. That's what you got to, it can't be no peace unless we do that. So you want to get in the corner and, and, and just go along and not believe it. Hey, you better and try to try to just deal. I'm talking about for the woman. Okay, but one thing we're going to do in this house. You can't be set up. And how you a man sit up in the house and your wife is, is doing something in and everything? I done heard it all. 
How you allowing that? <laughs> I done heard it. I'm telling you, I done heard it all. You got to stop that. You have to stop that. You Because you the head. Let's go to uh, Genesis, the 35th chapter. See, you can make the decision in the midst of uh, some false worship to stop worshiping falsely as a man. You can do that. Ain't no way in the world I'm sitting up in my house and it's a Christmas tree in there. Hey, it ain't happening. That man, that, that Christmas tree, I'll get a ticket from the city. It'll be on my front lawn burning. I'm not coming home and it's pork in my, in my refrigerator. Genesis, the 35th chapter, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Here we see the example of Jacob, who the covenant was confirmed with Abraham, Isaac. Now he's got a son, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. But let's go to Genesis 35 and pick it up at verse 1. When you ready, go ahead. And God said unto Jacob, uh -huh. Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make thee an altar unto God. Go ahead. appeared unto thee when thou fleetest from the face of Esau, thy brother. Uh -huh. Then Jacob said unto his household, to all that were with him. Put away the strange God that are among you and be clean and change your garments. So here Jacob was shown by the Lord what he should do. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel to the house of God and dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fledest from the face of Esau thy brother. So that's what he did, but he also made he made a proclamation and a commandment in his house. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Put that falsehood away. You had it why they took uh, the gods of Laban. If you read about it, Laban came looking for them false gods. But see, so now you obviously it was something going on here. In his household, he said, you got to put that, you got to put that away. See, as a man, you got to tell your household, you got to put that away. It don't matter that they grew up in something. And you pussyfooting around and try and lollygagging and not being a man in your house, you need to be the man in that house. I'll tear down brick by brick. This is what we're gonna do. You gonna sit your butt down. You gonna stop dealing false. We're not doing, these are what my kids are going to do. Verse 3, you got to be uncompromising. Verse 3, it says, and let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God. I'm going to do what God said to do. Who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. See, the man is supposed to be following God. Verse 4. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hands, uh -huh. and all the earrings which were in their ears. So and he, Jacob hid them under the oak which was by, which was by children. So he took all that stuff and put it there. But now let's go to uh, Psalm. Psalm. Thank you. Psalms 101st Division. Because he would want to see something David said about what he was going to do in his household. See, you have to be an example. Psalms 101 and verse 1. When you ready, go ahead. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. He said, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I'm going to praise you. And what he said something about how he's going to behave. Verse 2. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Go ahead. For when thou will come unto me, uh -huh. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. He said, I will walk within my house with a perfect house or in my household. I'm going to be an example to my household. That's what the man is supposed to be doing. So if you're looking inside yourself and you evaluate yourself right now based on what does say the Lord, which is what you should be doing, you need to question, is that what I'm doing? Is that what I'm doing? Am I an example in my household? Am I leading my household spiritually in the way in which they should go? You can't be worried about what anybody else thinks. You can't be worried about what her parents think. You can't be worried about what your parents think. You can't be worried about what she thinks. You can't be worried about the kids thinking it's crazy. This is the way in which we're going. This is, ain't no compromise. And then she said, well, I'm leaving. I'm just, well, you, you hit the bricks. Kick rocks. 
If you're going to leave, leave. I'm not kicking you out. But understand, this is the way it was my household is going. You don't want to be a part of that? Oh, well. Let's go to Numbers of 30th chapter. You are the covering in the house as the man. And here we see in Torah, we see the example of that. This is Numbers of 30th chapter. Everything is out of order. Numbers of 30th chapter, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Numbers 30 and 1, when you ready, go ahead. And Moses speaking to the heads of the tribes concerning the church individuals, uh, saying, uh -huh. This is the thing which the Lord had commanded. Go ahead. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with the bar, uh -huh. he should not break his word. He should do according to all that proceed of out of his mouth. So as a man, if you make a vow unto the Lord, you better keep the vow. Why? Because you're a man amongst, amongst human beings. Ain't nobody higher than the man. You at the top of the top as the man. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bar, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. That's why he tell you what, lady, it's yay be yay, your nay be nay. But now let's pick it up at verse three. We ready? Go ahead. If a woman also vow vow unto the Lord and bind herself by bond, being in her father's house in her youth. So now, if a, now he gets the distinction. If a woman does it, but she's in her father's house, he makes the distinction because understand the daughter, you are under the covering of your father. When you are in your father's house and when you leave, what's supposed to happen is supposed to be a smooth transition of cover, of protection and provision. You're supposed to go into your husband's house and then he will be your cover. But it said, if a woman also bow down to the Lord and bind herself by bond, being in her father's house in her youth. Here we see that the man truly is the head spiritually. Verse four. And her father hear her vow. Uh -huh. And her bond with which she had bound her soul. Go ahead. And her father shall hold his peace of her. Then all her vows shall stand. Uh -huh. And every bond with which she had bound her soul shall stand. So now she makes the vow and the father hears it and he holds his peace. Meaning he doesn't say anything about the vow. Then everything she says shall stand. But what about if he doesn't agree with the vow? Go ahead. But if her father disallow her in the day that he hear it, uh -huh. not any of her vows or of her bonds with which she had bound her soul shall stand. And the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. He can dis, if he doesn't agree with it, the father can disallow. Understand something. The, the vow that this daughter had made with God. Why? Because he is the spiritual head of that household. That's how. So it's not only that he can do that to his daughter, but go ahead. And if she had or had a husband when she vowed or uttered up of her lips for when she bound her soul. So now you got a situation where if they say a woman had a husband and she made a vow. Go ahead. And her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it. So in this case, he heard the vow, the husband heard it, and he didn't say anything. He held his peace. Go ahead. Then her vow shall stand, and her bonds with which she bound her soul shall stand. Then it says her vow shall stand because her husband didn't say anything. But what about if he didn't agree with it? Verse 8. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard, uh -huh. then he shall make her vow with which she vowed and that which she uttered with her lips, with which she found her soul of none effect, and the Lord shall forgive her. He can make the vow of none effect. He said, we're going to have to cancel that. <laughs> that shows you, that again, that you are, as a man, you are the spiritual head of your household. So therefore, you have a great responsibility not just to provide the monetary and the financial needs, but also spiritual direction. Let's go to uh, Job, the first chapter. Here we see an example of that in Job, spiritually guiding his household. This is Job 1, and we want to pick it up at verse 1. Job 1 and verse 1. When you ready, go ahead. There was a man in the land of us uh -huh. whose name was Job. Go ahead. That man was perfect and upright. Uh -huh. The one that feared God and obscured evil. So here you have Job. He was perfect and upright. One that feared God and eschewed evil. He hated evil. Verse 2. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. So in his household he had ten children. Go ahead. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she-asses. And a very great household. 
said that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. So he was a righteous man and he was a very wealthy man. But now let's skip, uh, let's go right into verse four. When you ready, go ahead. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day. And sit and call for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So now you have these sons and daughters. They come together and they feast. But verse 5. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them. So it said Job, after that feasting, Job sent and he sanctified them. How? Go ahead. And rolled up early in the morning. And offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. He offered offerings just like Jacob in the days of old. He said, we're going up to Bethel. We're going to build an altar. We're going to sacrifice unto our God as was commanded. In these days, he sanctified them. He says, it says, and it was so when the days of their feasting were going about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. He had 10 kids. We should understand about sacrificing the days of sacrifice. Sacrificing wasn't free. You had to give up some to sacrifice. So he had a lot, but he gave it up. And we're going to find out why. Go ahead. Because Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So understand, wrap your mind around it. Job sacrificed continually for all his children just in case. Just in case one of his children Curse God, not out of their lips. They didn't utter it with their voice. He did it just in case they were thinking. That's how you know. That's why I say he was perfect and upright. Wasn't that fear God in the shoot evil? That's why you can understand when he said, when they were accusing him, accusing him, he must have done something wrong with all these things happening in his life. He lost his kids. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. He said, listen, I, I made a covenant with my eyes that I wouldn't even look upon a maid to lust that he was, his thinking was different. Similar to what he tells you in, his, in Matthew, we read, the Messiah says, written, I shall not commit adultery, but I said, he not, should not even look upon a woman to lust after her. Somebody else's wife. That's what it's telling you. He had a different way of thinking. But that's the type of stuff you would do if you are worried about your household and you are the spiritual head of your household. He said, I'm sanctifying y'all. I'm making a sacrifice for each and every one of y'all just in case you had the wrong thought. Not that you said it, but you might have had the wrong thought. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. Because it is the responsibility of the man. Again, I know there's a heavy emphasis on men, but you are the head. And the failures that we see is evident. Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. Because what are you commanded to do as the man? Let's pick it up at verse 5. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 5. When you ready, go ahead. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me. So this is Moses here. I've taught you these statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me. Go ahead. That you should do so in the land, whether you go to possess it. Go ahead. Keep therefore and do them. Why? For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nation. He said, keep therefore and do them. What? The statutes, the judgments. The commandments. Torah. He said, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Wisdom is embedded within the laws, the statutes, the commandments, the judgments, the ordinances of God. And, and in your keeping them, you will seem to be wise. It would be wise for you to do that. Because you're dealing with what thus said the Lord. He's showing you how to look at every field of human endeavor. But well, go ahead. Which you'll hear all these statues and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So now this would, this is ultimately the law is what sanctified you. Set you apart from the other nations who are worshiping falsely. So that they would look at you and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. But that's because of Torah. But go ahead. For what nation is there so great? None. Go ahead. Who had God so nigh unto them? As the Lord your God is in all things that we call upon him for. What nation is there so great? None. Only you are known of all the nations of the earth. He tells you, Paul tells you, what advantage does it have to do with what profit is there of circumcision? Much chiefly in every way, for unto them were committed the oracles of God. He said, for what nation is there so great who have God so nigh or near unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Verse 8. 
And what nation is that so great? Uh -huh. That have statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law. What nation? None. Go ahead. Which I said before you this day. But what should you do? Only take heed to thyself uh -huh. and keep thy soul diligently. It's that forget the things which thine eyes have seen, unless they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. You don't willy nilly serve the Most High. It's a diligent thing. You read about what David said. They're not meditating on your word. It's a constant thing. He said, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, because it's easy to get off the path. Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. Oftentimes, we'll forget about the things in our personal lives, forget about what God has done for us, let alone forget about what God has done for our forefathers. So it's going to take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart, from thy heart all the days of thy life. But what should you do? But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. That's what men are supposed to do. Men are commanded to teach Torah to their, ch to their children, to their sons. One thing I'm always grateful for is what my father did for me. My father ain't no, no time in my life my father ain't never did for me. Even up to this day, whether it be advice or anything, he, all, he always been there providing. But the greatest thing he did for me, he, was, he taught me the word of God. There's no way I can repay him for that. Ain't no sense of me counting now. All I can say is thank you. But, and teach my children. Do the same thing for my children. But now let's go to uh, Proverbs, the 22nd chapter. Proverbs, the 22nd chapter. You want to pick it up at verse uh, 22. Because he said you have, to, you have to teach thy sons and thy sons' sons from generation to generation to generation. And when you do that, what will happen? Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, you wouldn't have all this confusion. <laughs> Look at our youth today. It is clear that they have no moral compass because you're the moral compass. Particularly in a household, the man is the moral compass. Even the basic things, even before you get to the worship of God specifically, even if you think about stealing and killing, you Look at the prisons, and one thing you will see: no father was there. They're giving those men direction. You think you when you look at when you look at prostitution, you think all those women had a father in their house covering them? And more often times they did not. Proverbs, the 22nd chapter. And we want to pick it up at verse 6. Do a survey if you could go to a jail and you say, What's your father in your life? And you, they, might, they might even tell you, well, he down in cell block A. You can ask him. Probably he, and he'll tell you no. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. When you ready, go ahead. Train up a child in the way he should go. You got to train up a child in the way in which he should go. What you training him with, though? You training him with the word. You have to instill that in him. It don't come by just osmosis. You have to put it in him. It said train up a child in the way he should go. And what's going to happen? And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's how the nation should have been in righteousness from generation to generation to generation. But when you read about them coming, you know, they're coming into the land and you read about them in the days of judges, they didn't, they were doing whatever. They forgot what their forefathers did or what they, what they saw. They weren't worshiping God. You were supposed to pass that down. People worry about some life insurance. You need to pass this down from generation to generation to generation. Now let's go to uh, Genesis. This, thank you. The second chapter. Because we want to find out the wife's role. Genesis, the second chapter. And we want to pick it up at verse 18. Genesis, the second chapter and verse 18. Because again, everybody has a role. And Things are all out of pocket today. But let's look at the role. Genesis 2 and verse 18. Are you ready? Go ahead. The Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Uh -huh. I will make him and help me for him. It said, and the Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and it said his boss. Help me. A peace stiller. Help me. A nag. A help me. It says a help fit for him. So 
Understand, if you are a woman, what your role is to be according to what does say the Lord. Because some would say, well, that's sexist. And I don't care about what you think it is. This is what does say the Lord. It says, I will make him and help me for him. You're supposed to be a help fit for him. So now understand, if you are supposed to, if you if you play in your proper position and you're supposed to be a help me, you need to consider who you're going to be a help me for. Because you won't want to be able to help me for somebody who's not doing what they're supposed to do, who has no purpose, no direction, not dealing with what thus said the Lord. And then you mad, you were hooked up with him. He was sleeping on his mama couch selling dope when you met him. Now you mad because your life didn't turn out the way in which it should have. You better be, better be conscious of who you choose. It said, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So you want to be with somebody who had the potentiality to lead in the first place. In a proper way. That's your job. You can't get around it. You can kind of get around it, but you're going to cause havoc in your household and you out of your position. Everybody got to play that position. You got, you got, you playing basketball. You got a point guard on the court. The point guard got a position. The center got a position. Everybody have a position. You got the center. He can't hardly dribble. He's slew for trying to come down the court. You, man, if you don't get in the, in the post on that block and do what you're supposed to do and back him down and dunk on him, you don't dribble. I dribble. I'm a point guard. But now let's pick it up in verse 21. When you ready, go ahead. And the Lord God called the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. Uh-huh. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and stared thereof. We read that. And so he took this rib from the man, and you, again, this is where you come from. You came up out of the man. You got these, <laughs> you got these hotel Negroes running around here talking about the black woman that's got as you understand what a woman is. A woman incubates life. A woman incubates life. First of all, a woman came from the man. She incubates life. The life is in the man. He puts it in the woman. She incubates it and gives it to him. And that's ultimately her function, even in life. You get you bring home you bring home some raw meat. She done made a meal out of it. That's what she does. But go ahead. And the rib was the Lord God had taken from man, made her a woman, and brought her unto the man. And he brought her unto the man and said, "You're supposed to be a help me." So again, let's do some self examination, just like I did with the brother. If you're a woman, do some self evaluation. Are you being a help me to your husband? That's you need to ask yourself that question. Well, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians because that's what you're supposed to be. What, what you see today is women have established, uh, especially in this, in this Western world, they've established everything that they think they want. And then they, it's like you making a meal. Let's say you're making a meal. You got steak. You got potatoes. Your job is the steak. Your relationship between family and friends is the potatoes. You got some green beans on the side. You want to travel somewhere. And right on the side, why well, need a garnishment? I need a husband. He the piece of, he the little garnishment that nobody eats right on the side. That's what you made men into. That's why you miserable. Whoever told you that you don't need a man set you up for failure. Men and women need each other. Whoever told you, who was Beyonce, all the women independent? Yeah, she got a husband. All the women independent, ain't nobody independent. We are interdependent. Everybody has a role to play. And you can't figure out why. You done wasted all your years. Now you're at a point where what, what, I want to have this. Well, you didn't approach this thing properly. First uh, Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and let's pick it up at verse 8. And he makes it very clear. When you're ready, go ahead. But the man is not of the woman. The man is not of the woman. Go ahead. But the woman of the man. But the woman of the man. That's what it is. Go ahead. Neither was the man created for the woman. Are you sure? You read, he said, neither was the man created for the woman. But what? For the woman, for the man. Woman, you were created for the man. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand your role. 
And if you're not functioning that, see, you can have the title of wife and not function as a wife. You see that all the time. This is my wife. She's surely not functioning like one. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So I would say, well, what about the man? Y'all just dealt with that. I'm talking about you right now. Let's go to uh, Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Because you can have it for sure while well, man not dealing with dealing in his role. Everybody has to play their position. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, we're going to pick it up at verse 22. It's this all up. You can't get around this. That's even when you look at, the, at a woman talking about, I'm going to teach over a congregation. Somebody had a question uh, in the in uh, Bible said, what about a priest? There ain't no such thing. Because when you look at the order of leadership, you got you have men at the head of that. But Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 22. When you ready, go ahead. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as all well as unto the Lord. So just how you how you obey the Lord, that's how you're supposed to obey your husband. It's not what I think about it. Well, I you know, I think this or I think that. he said for the husband, or he said, excuse me, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Go ahead. Verse 23. Thank you. For the husband is the head of the wife, uh -huh. and even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. He said, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Again, taking you back to that example. When you look at what Christ was, obviously he was the husband. His wife was supposed to be doing what she what he told her to do. That's that's the woman's role. Submission. I know that is not this not feminism. <laughs> It's what thus said the Lord. Go ahead. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands and everything. We don't question whether or not Israel was supposed to be in subjection to God. We keep looking at them and be like, man, that's messed up. Look at this. They did that. They did that. They did this. They all out of pocket. Look at your woman. Look at the woman. The same thing. It said, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be, un be to their own husbands in everything. Not something, not what I feel like doing. He said in everything. See, that's that and that, and you got to think about it. That's a very vulnerable situation to be in as a woman. But that gives you a little insight on what you should be looking for. If you got to be in subjection to a man, what kind of man would you marry? You bet you need to marry one that's following what does say the Lord. Because you know he's not gonna abuse you, know he's gonna be trying to love you like, like he loves himself. He's gonna try to uh lead the household in a way in which it should go. So you got to play your position though, and in playing your position. That burden that you running around, that you carrying like a mule, will be off your back. Because you weren't built to carry. I'm mom and daddy. You better stop lying to yourself. That child got all kinds of deficiencies. Why? Because you can't be mama and daddy. That's just reality. Man can't be mama and daddy. The woman can't be mama and daddy. You got a, a mother and a father. But go ahead. Verse 25. Thank you. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself. Uh huh. And again, husbands are supposed to love their wives. But now let's pick it up at verse, uh, excuse me, at uh, first Timothy. Let's go to first Timothy. Because again, the Bible tells us what the woman should do. Everybody has a role to play. First Timothy, the fifth chapter, we want to pick it up at verse. Uh, thank you. Verse 14. When you ready, what does he tell uh, Timothy in this epistle? When you ready, go ahead. I would therefore that the young women marry, uh -huh. bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. He's telling you what you should do. He said, I would therefore that the younger women marry. Mar See, ultimately, I know, what, I know what society is telling you. I know what the schools are socially conditioning you to do. But at the end of the day, when you feel something inside of you telling you, no, this, I want children, I want to marry. Yeah, because that's the natural progression. He said, I will therefore that the younger women marry. And he said, so he said, bear children. 
And that's better done in your younger years. He said, guard the house. He said, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Let's go to uh, Titus. Because like anything else, oftentimes you don't necessarily know how to do any of that. Why? Because you don't have an example. You need an example. Just like men. One thing about manhood, for example, a man, just because you're a male don't make you a man. Manhood is something that you come into, and it is not just biolog biological. It is when you, when you get to a point where you know and understand you're dealing with sacrificing responsibility as a man. That's when you're coming into manhood. It's not that you just become a man because you, you're 37. You could be a 37-year-old just male. But now let's pick it up in Titus, the second chapter. Because we need an example. That's why it's so important. You don't see it in our households. Fathers. So that means the man, the boy don't know how to be a man. A woman cannot teach. It's certain things a woman cannot teach about being a man and vice versa. You got a daughter, you, you may, I done read this in the book, but I don't know what that's about. Second, uh, excuse me, uh, Titus, the second chapter in uh, verse three. Because he gives here, he gives direction and how you should know what to do. Titus two and three, when you ready, go ahead. The age women likewise, uh -huh. that they be in behaviors that come to holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. But they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blessed. You can think, you can, again, like anything else, you can, people, when they talk about marriage, anybody that's been married a, a little while, you went into marriage, you didn't have a clue. You had, you were totally blind. You was in what you call love, all getting you to win that thing, and you had no idea what you were getting yourself into, and nobody told you. He said the aged woman likewise that they be in behavior as becoming holiness. So he's talking about the women who have a little age on them. He said they need to behave themselves in holiness, not false accusers. They're not running, he said not giving to much. Why not run around getting tipsy? They said teachers of good things. You talking about a woman teaching, that's what she should be teaching. What should she be teaching? Other women on how to be right. That they may teach the young women the one that Paul said earlier need to marry and guide the house. He said that you may teach them to be sober, meaning sober-minded, to love their husbands. Well, how in the world does a woman love a husband? It's through submission. That's how a woman loves a husband. It is through submission. To love their children and understand that the husband is the one in which is the head of the household. So I said, love their husbands, to love their children. You provide for your children. And it says to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Again, if you're a woman, you married, do a little bit of self-evaluation. If you're listening at home, do some self-evaluation. Is this what you're doing? If your husband's sitting right next to you, he might be, no. I don't know. Hopefully that's what you're doing. You should be doing that. Let's go to Proverbs, the 14th chapter. Everybody has a position to play. We don't want to play our position. They can't figure out why everything messed up. Proverbs, the 14th chapter. Are you functioning in your position, in your role? Proverbs, the 14th chapter, verse 1. Because what does a wise woman do? Go ahead. Every wise woman buildeth her house. Every wise woman buildeth her house. But what? But the fool is plucking it down with her hands. But the fool is plucking it down with her hands. You are part of a household. You are part of a mass household. You're a wise woman. You're helping him in his purpose. You helping him on this path. Y'all walking the path of life together. As a wise woman, it says you build at the house. But if you're a foolish woman, you want everything to pluck it down, to tear it down. Let's go to uh, Proverbs the 24th chapter. Just see how a household is built. Proverbs the 24th chapter. And we're going to pick it up at verse 3. 
Proverbs 24, verse 3. Are you ready? Go ahead. Through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established. Through wisdom is a house built in the first place, and by understanding it is established. And we should understand, particularly men, the, the main thing for a woman or a wife or a potential wife is not what she looked like. It's particular qualities that she has. That's first, second, and third. Is this a God-fearing woman? Is this a wise woman? Is this a woman that's going to be a good wife and mother? Let's, let's look at this. Let's go to, uh, let's go to uh, Proverbs, the 31st chapter. <clears throat> Proverbs, the 31st chapter. We're going to pick it up at verse uh, 10. Because this is the kind of woman you should be. See, again, the Bible is telling you, it's giving you examples of manhood. It's giving you examples of womanhood. It's giving you examples. So if you don't have them in your life, you never saw it in real time. He giving it to you through the word. Proverbs, the 31st chapter, and verse 10. When you ready, go ahead. Who can find a virtuous woman? Go ahead. For her price is far above you, Ruby. He said, who can find a virtuous woman? A woman of virtue. A modest woman. A wise woman. A God-fearing woman. I'm going to tell you today, a lot of women think they are this, and they are not. I'm a virtue. You don't even know what virtue is. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above ruby. Her value is far above ruby, but you can't find her. It ain't like she's just walking around everywhere. But here we see the benefit of her. Verse 11. The heart of her husband doubt safely trust in her, uh -huh. so that he shall have no need of spoil. Does your husband trust in you? He said the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. Why? Because he know what kind of woman she is. So that he shall have no need of spoil. Verse 12. She was doing good and not evil all the days of her life. Is, is, is this you? <laughs> or is your husband miserable because of your behavior? She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Go ahead. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. So she's not lazy. She's not lazy. She seeketh wool and flax and working willingly with her hands. Go ahead. She's like a merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She's bringing value. Verse 15. She rises also while it's yet dark and giving me to her household and a portion to her maid. She's rising while it was yet night or dark and giving me to her household and a portion to her maidens. See, she has a certain type of character. Her husband can trust in her. She's not... Lazy. When everybody sleeps, she up doing stuff. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maids. She want to make sure everybody provided for. Verse 16. She considereth the field and bathroom. Mm -hmm. With the fruit of her hand, she planted the vineyard. With the fruit of her hand, she's planted the vineyard. Verse 17. She girded her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. She's virtuous. Verse 18. She perceived that her merchandise is good. Her candles go not out by the night. She perceived it that her merchandise is your merchandise good. Are you good? Her candle go not out by night. Because she's always doing something for the household. Go ahead. Verse 19. She laid her hands to the spindle mm -hmm. and her hands hold the distaff. Go ahead. She stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she stretches forth her hands to the needy. She, and then not, not only that, she's concerned about others. She stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to those who are in need. Is this you? <laughs> Everybody, you got all these verses, women running around here, but the, the Bible says who can find one? Verse 21. She's not afraid of the snow for uh -huh. her household. Go ahead. For all her household are clothed with scars. She's not afraid of the snow for her household. She's not afraid of doing the things necessary, and her household is benefited from that. Verse 22. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. What about her husband? Her husband is known in the gates when uh -huh. he sitteth among the elders of the land. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. One thing about when you see great men, oftentimes, if they've been prosperous, a lot of times you don't see a woman that's bringing them down usually. 
You usually see, particularly back in the day, you would see a supportive woman. Her husband is not in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Verse 24. She make it fine linen and sell it and deliver it girdles unto the mirrors. Uh -huh. Strength and honor are her clothes. Go ahead. And she shall rejoice in time to come. Strength and honor are her clothes. She will rejoice. Go ahead. She opened her mouth with wisdom. She got some foolishness to say. It says she opened her mouth with wisdom. So when she has something to say, it's something. Why? Is this you? Go ahead. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. So if she's not saying something that's that's ignorant, stupid, or try, or embarrassing, <laughs> and she's not saying something that's unkind, she opened her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Are you kind? You need again. Is this you? Verse twenty-seven. She looked well to the ways of her household and eat it not the. Bread of idleness. She's worried about a household again. She's not idle, sitting there, not doing anything. Go ahead. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her children arise up and call her blessed. What about her husband? Her husband also. He ain't got nothing but good things to say about you. And he prays with her. Go ahead. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. He said, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Now, I know we know today, particularly in this era, <laughs> When you got Instagram models, <laughs> everybody taking a selfie every five seconds. Everybody, <laughs> you think you're looking so, a type of way, you might not be looking that way. You're thinking you look good, but what about what about uh, beauty? Go ahead. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. That's ultimately that's not what it's about. That's not what true value is. Because if you if you understand anything about biology, no matter how good you look as a woman right now, eventually, and I'm not talking about 60, 70, I'm talking about around 30 something, it's you gonna start to decline. Like everybody. Well, that's just what happens. That's just what it is. So what you need to do is develop your character. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. It said, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Is this you? Is this you? Again, we all can do some self-evaluation. Fame is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Who can find a virtuous woman? Verse 31. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gate. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise Praise her in the gates. Hope not she run off at the mouth or run around with a shirt talking about flawless. Negro, please. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Let's go to uh, 1 Samuel. We see an example of, of, a, of a, a wise woman. This is uh, 1 Samuel, the 25th chapter. 1 Samuel, the 25th chapter. And, and we want to pick it up at verse uh, 2. 1 Samuel 25 and 2, because here we got David on the run. David trying to get away from Saul, and he comes in contact with his neighbor. This 25, 1 Samuel 25 and verse 2, and you ready? Go ahead. And there was a man in my own whose possessions were in Carmel. Mm -hmm. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was sharing his sheep in Carmel. Go ahead. Now the name of the man was Nabal, uh -huh. and the name of his wife Abigail. Go ahead. She was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish, and evil in his doing, and he was of the house of Caleb. So now you had this man, he had a lot of possessions. His name was Nabal. And then, but he had a wife, his, her name was Abigail. It said something about her. It said, not that she was just good looking. She had a beautiful countenance, but it said something else, a woman of good understanding. He, on the other hand, not so much. It said he was churlish and he was a fool. That's what it's, you will find that out as we continue to read. It said, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings. So he was a fool and he was evil. Now let's, let's keep, uh, where we at? We had a verse. Verse 10. Thank you. Verse 10. Verse 10. Are you ready? Go ahead. And Nabal answered David's service and said, who is David? Uh-huh. Who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. So now David was asking for something, and David had been, a, and his man had been a covert to this man's service, Nabal's service, and he asked some of his provisions. He's like, man, who was David? I ain't thinking about David. Why should I give him some of my stuff? Verse 11. 
Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears mm -hmm. and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? So he says, I take what I have and give to this man. Who was David? Verse 12. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those saints. So now they, went, they had to come with that news to David. David was a mighty warrior. Roland was some mighty warriors. But go ahead. And David said unto his men, Gird you on every man his sword, and they girded on every man his sword. Uh -huh. David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 of bold by the stuff. So David girded his sword, and he had all his men gird the sword. But Abigail heard about what took place. And again, we read Abigail, one well, of this beautiful continents. Abigail had good understanding. Verse 14. But one of the men told Abigail, Nabal's wife said, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. They say, man, he told David. He told David such and such, and he railed on them. Go ahead, verse 15. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt. Neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the field. So he said, they, kind of, they were kind of protecting us out there. Go ahead. There was a wall unto us, both by day and night, and uh -huh. all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Go ahead. Now, therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do. But evil is determined against thy master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. So now we should understand David was going to kill everything moving. Well, not anything left pissing that pissing against the wall. David, well, he, again, David was no joke. But now this woman, again, of Nabal's household, is told him, hey, this whole household. It said, now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household. This household about to be destroyed of which she's a part of. But she's a wise woman, though. It said, for he is, and then talking about her husband, it says, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak unto him. He's so, Belial, when he says that, that, that any of his things like somebody's worthless. No good. You can't even talk to him. Verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on ash. She got to work. Go ahead. And she said, as well, servants, go before me. Behold, I come after you. Uh -huh. But she told not her husband Nabal. So she didn't go tell him, you fool, you this, you that. She didn't say nothing. But <laughs> she did what was necessary. She did that, didn't tell her husband. Verse 20. Oh, verse, uh, forgive me, verse 23. And when Abigail saw David, she hastened and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground mm -hmm. and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray, thee speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Uh -huh. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, she, she said, so now she gave these provisions, uh, she gave these things unto uh, David. Why? Because death was coming to everybody. It said, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. Nabal or Nabalah in Hebrew means, <laughs> means folly. That's why they say that. That's why they said here. Because when you look at Nabalah or Nabal, it means folly. But go ahead. But I, thy handmaid, saw not the young man of my Lord whom thou didst send. Uh -huh. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, as our soul liveth, seeing the Lord have withholding thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be his neighbor. So now, and, and what happened was, he, he that anger was ceased. But how was it ceased? It was because of a wise woman doing something. She was concerned with her, about her household, that household that she's a part of, and ultimately Nabal ended up dying. Abigail ended up becoming the wife of David, but not the king, who eventually became king. But now let's go to Exodus, the uh, fourth chapter. Exodus, the fourth chapter. And let's pick it up at verse 24. Exodus 4 and verse 24. Here's another example of a woman operating in some wisdom, doing something that's beneficial for her husband and her, and her household. 
the Exodus, the fourth chapter, and verse 24. When you ready, go ahead. And he came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. So he was going to kill who? The Lord was going to kill Moses. Verse 25. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet. Mm -hmm. It said, surely a bloody husband I got to me. So now he was going to kill him because he hadn't circumcised his son as he was supposed to and his wife did. So even when you're talking about Moses, it's who was certainly a servant of the Lord. But even his his wife in this instance is, is operating in some wisdom, and she she circumcised the son and said, So he let him go, save Moses' life. Moses, the Lord is about to kill Moses. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. So understand, we all men and women need to do some self-evaluation. Are we operating in the role in which we are beginning? Are we operating as a husband and a father? Are we operating as a, a wife and a mother? Let's, let's go to the, to, to the progeny. Let's go to the children. We almost finished. Let's go to Proverbs, the uh, 20th chapter. Proverbs, the 20th chapter. Because there's something you need to understand about children. Proverbs, the 20th chapter. And let's pick it up at verse 11. Proverbs, the 20th chapter and verse 11. When you ready, go ahead. Even a child is known by his doing. Even a child is known by his doing. What does this mean? You'll know, you'll know a tree by the fruit. You'll know a child by his doing, even when they're young. That's why people can look at somebody and say, that boy, bad. Because <laughs> he two years old, wreaking havoc. <laughs> right? He running around tearing up stuff, cussing out grown folks. It said, even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. You can tell that early on by a child. See, and every child is not the same. You have to give children what they need. First of all, you understand that all children should be trained up in the way in which they should go. But now let's go to uh, Proverbs, the 22nd child. Because oftentimes what the direction in which a child is on is based on what's happening with their mother and father. This is Proverbs, the 22nd chapter. We want to pick it up at verse 15. Because now, again, you need to learn, know something about children. Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, and verse 15. When you ready, go ahead. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. That state mind is always on foolishness. When you look at a child and some of the things that they do, even look when you were a kid, you say, I don't know what I was thinking. You, your brain wasn't developed all the way yet. Tell me what you were thinking. You was 12. Even when you get to upper teens, his brain still developing. So now he said foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. That's what their mind is on, but what? But the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. You have to bring discipline to children. First of all, you need to, you need to just, you, know, you need to first and foremost teach them what they say the Lord so they have a moral compass. But even with that, they battling against their own foolishness, against themselves, doing things that would be detrimental to themselves. And you got to bring the rod of correction. That's what you had to do. You can't just let children do what they want to do. They, a child will destroy himself. A child will get herself in the situations that she ruins her life. So when you look at the role of a child, ultimately you have to make sure as a, as a parent that the child is fulfilling their role, which is to do this. Let's go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Again, we're almost finished. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. You can't just let children do what they want to do. Here he tells you not, so you got to make sure what, they, what they're doing is correct. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and here we can see the duty of a child. Ephesians 6 and 1. We ready? Go ahead. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. He said, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And here we see, again, father, son, man, woman, and child. Everybody have a role. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is one of the, the Ten Commandments. Verse 2. 
Honor thy father and mother, mm -hmm. which is the first commandment with promise. So when you think about a child, all you have to do as a child is to obey. They children, listen, that's, that's your duty. Obey what your parents tell you to do. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. That what? That it may be well with thee. That it may be well with thee. Go ahead. And thou mayest live long on the earth. And, I, and I, I'm going to read this verse 4 again just to throw this in here. It said, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't provoke your children. Don't abuse your children. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Last place, Colossians 3. Because what's the order? Again, play your position. Play your position. Colossians 3 and verse 18. Here we see him breaking it down as far as the position. What's the order? When you ready, go ahead. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Wives, submit. Go ahead. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Husbands, love. Go ahead. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well pleasing unto the Lord. And children, obey. Wives, submit. Husbands, love. And children, obey. So if you're confused about what you should be doing, it's all laid out for us in the word of God. And that's order within the family unit. It is always my prayer that you are edified. And with that, we're going to stand up, face Jerusalem, and close out. <clears throat> Our Father, which are in heaven. Our Father, which are in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. We forgive our debt to us. We forgive our debt to us. Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Praise the Lord God of Israel. That he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. These things we pray in Jesus' name. These things we pray in Jesus' name. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. Mighty One of Jacob. Mighty One of Jacob. The Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. The King of Kings. And the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Okay, again, it's a blessing um, for everybody to be able to uh, fellowship with each other even through via the internet. And uh, it's my prayer that you were edified. And I don't know if anybody had any questions. Okay, uh, so go ahead. Um, first question is in St. John 14 and verse 22, what Judas is this? Uh, St. John 14 and 22. 22. Okay, so uh, Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Um, so it's just another man named Judas. It is not, give me one second. It's not a Judas Iscariot. Judah was a, a, a popular name kind of like we were talking about last night in Bible study. Who is this Mary? Is this Mary? Well, there's a lot of different Mary of Bethany, Mary Magdalene, Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. You got, you got a lot of Marys. You got people who have uh, names with common. Okay. Um, one second. Um, let's go to Luke, the sixth chapter. And pick it up at verse 16. Uh, well, let's pick it up at verse, because it could have been this one. Luke 6, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 13. It says, and when it was day, I'm in Luke 6 and verse 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, who also he named apostles. 
verse 14, Simon, whom, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Judas, excuse me, Philip and Bartholomew. Whoa, let me start off. Verse 14, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was a traitor. So you had you had more than one person named Judas. So it could have it could have been that Judas. Okay, that was another question. Yeah, I'm sorry, you had something on that? Yeah. You had another question? The second question is how will Israel know? Oh, he said thank you. Um, how will Israel know the exact time to flee to the wilderness in Moab slash Ammon? And he the person referenced Daniel eleven and verse forty one. Right. Okay. So let's go to Matthew, the 24th chapter. Because the question is, how do you know when to flee? Well, the, the Bible tells you when you're supposed to flee. Uh, Matthew, the 24th chapter. And verse, uh, we'll pick it up at three. It says, and as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Okay, so they wanted to know. He talked about the deception that would be taking place. He talked about and warned of not being deceived. He talked about wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquake, and disease. He talked famines and earthquakes. He talked about the uh, the beginning of sorrows and how some would be delivered up to be killed. And then he goes on to say, verse fifteen: When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in a holy place whoso read it let him understand okay then he said uh why verse 21 he said for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time nor nor ever shall be so he also tells you in verse 16 then let them which be in, in Judea flee to the mountains it's time to flee at that time um, so when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see the Pope stand in the temple that is going to be rebuilt, you, you need you need to be leaving. That's that's how you know what time. Now, when he said down you the 11th chapter. Uh, and verses, I don't know, did he say 41? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, because those places escape. OK, and I want to make it clear. Also, the Great Tribulation is 1260 days. We know that from Daniel 7, verse 23 and 12 and 7, both in Daniel. But you have you have a particular window in there as well. Um, so. Prior to that, rather, I should say. Um, that is be time to flee. OK. He talks about one place, 1290 days. You're gonna have you gonna have a time where the Pope is gonna be basically setting up his himself and stopping the daily sacrifice that will be taking place at this time. Okay. So you you're gonna you're gonna have a little time. When you see him in the temple, you know it's time to go. That's that's ultimately what it is. Um he, he makes that pretty clear in Matthew 24. He has something in there. Is that the only question? No, no, there's one more. But he said thank you. Okay, um, so nice. The other question was, can you explain John 13 and verse 34? John 13, verse 34. Um, okay, so John 13 and verse 34, um, he says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Um, one thing about this is that it is new in a sense of not being adhered to. Um, Let's go, let's go to, uh, let's see, one second. See, because love, if you go to Torah, it's not something that's 
No, but if you even look at the disposition of the people, you look at how they came at the Messiah, you look through that conversation and the questions that they ask, they're asking, if you look at the judgments that they were bringing forth, like the woman they caught in adultery and not bringing the man, when you look at that, they weren't operating, even though they had Torah, these people were the people we came into and manifesting themselves unto, they were not operating in a proper way. So it's like, it's new because you're not doing it. That's why he talked, to, even when he talked about the scribes and the Pharisees, Sadducees, he called them hypocrites. He talked about how your righteousness has to exceed that. Why? Because they are not operating in the proper way. Matter of fact, the religious leaders are the ones that had him killed. The one who came in love from the Father. So now, so he said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Let's go to uh real quick. Let's go to uh let's go to Leviticus the 19th chapter and verse uh 17. Leviticus 19 and 17. Because love is not new, but they weren't operating in love. He says. In verse 17, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Then it says something, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So it's not like it had never been said that you were supposed to love. But uh, that he told him love one another. He said love them as you love yourself. But the problem is they're not operating in that. And that's why it's a new commandment. Um, you want to add on to that? Or expound? Let's go to the 14th chapter. A lot of times they're taking that to mean he did away with the commandments. So, so yeah, the commandment of love. But it just did 14 and 15. That's a big one. They tell you what love really is. Yeah. Okay. So now, John 14 and verse uh, 15, because my father's saying son will take it to. Meaning that we under the commandment of love, we don't have to keep the commandment. He expounds on what love is. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's John 14 and 15. And verse 21 said, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. And love is something, if you love God, you're going you're gonna to do the things pertaining to him in the commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. And if you love your neighbor, you're going to do the things pertaining to, the, your, uh, things pertaining to your neighbor in the commandments. You're not going to steal from your neighbor. You're not going to bear false witness against your neighbor. You're not going to commit adultery with your neighbor's wife. You're not going to uh, murder your neighbor. That's love. That's why I was saying earlier, love is not what even what ro romantic love or some gut feeling. It is an action. It is action. Okay? And how you love is based on who you are. Again, uh, wives submit, husbands love, and provision of protection and sacrifice, children obey. Okay? You had something else? Is that it? He said that. Thank you. Okay. All praises to the Most High. Again, and, uh, we hope you're edified. We pray that you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath.